Hello, my name is Paul Geyer, and I uh, am here to chat with you today about interior electrical distribution systems. This slide tells you a little bit about me and what I've been doing for the last few decades. This is what I'll be talking about today, kind of how I'll be chopping up the information or the chapters in the book, you might say. First, uh, some introductory comments, then chapter two, general power system criteria, third, power distribution and utilization, and part four is a glossary of terms that hopefully will help you out in the future. The criteria contained here are intended to ensure economical, durable, efficient, and reliable systems and installations. Whenever unique conditions and problems are not specifically covered by this discussion, use the applicable referenced industry standards and other documents for design guidance. This publication typically applies up to five feet beyond the facility envelope. It also applies to services supplying power from the utility system utilization transformer to the wiring system of the facility, circuits originating from the facility that extend beyond the facility envelope, wiring and connections for supplemental grounding systems, and wiring from and connections to non-utility equipment supplying power to the wiring system of the facility, including engine generator sets, photovoltaic power systems, and fuel cells. In addition to NFPA 70 requirements, facilities located outside of the United States must also comply with the applicable nation standards nation voltage and frequency shall generally apply. Different wiring and grounding conventions usually apply in other nations. However, follow the design principles provided in this discussion to the extent practical. Comply with applicable building codes and comply with the requirements of NFPA 70, the National Electrical Code and the requirements herein when a project or portion of a project has been designated as requiring critical operations power, treatment as a designated critical operations area per NFBA 70 Article 708. The requirements that are more stringent than this discussion take precedence over this discussion. Codes and standards are referenced throughout this publication, and the publication date of the code or standard is not routinely included with the document identification throughout the text of the document. In general, the latest issuance of a code or standard has been assumed for use. Some comments on general power system <coughs> criteria, the voltage, Unless there are specialty voltage requirements, the facility system voltage shall be based on the interior load requirements as follows. Apply 240-120 volt for small facilities with only single phase loads. Apply three phase four wire 208Y120V systems for lighting and power demand loads less than 150 kVA. Apply three phase four wire 480Y-277 volt systems for lighting and power demand loads greater than 150 kVA unless 208Y-120 volt systems are shown to be more cost effective. Use step down transformers inside the facility as required to obtain lower voltages. Apply a frequency of 60 Hz for distribution and utilization power in locations in which the commercially supplied frequency is other than 60 Hz, such as 50 Hz, use the available supplied frequency to the extent practical. Where frequencies other than that locally available are required for technical purposes, frequency conversion or generation equipment can be installed. Transformer design criteria provided here apply to interior applications. 
commonly facilities will be supplied by an exterior utility system pad mounted transformer. With regard to low voltage transformers, specified dry type transformers in accordance with NEMA standard 20 and the following. For transformers rated for 15 kVA or larger, use transformers with a 220 degree centigrade, 428 degree Fahrenheit insulation system, not to exceed a 115 degree centigrade, 239 degree Fahrenheit rise, capable of carrying continuously 115% of nameplate kVA without exceeding insulation rating at a maximum ambient temperature of 40 degrees centigrade, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Provide a transformer of 80 degrees centigrade temperature rise capable of carrying continuously 130% of nameplate KVA without exceeding insulation rating when additional overload capacity is required. Transformers rated less than 15 kVA can use a 180 degree centigrade, 356 degree Fahrenheit insulation system, not to exceed an 80 degree centigrade, 176 degree Fahrenheit rise at a maximum ambient temperature of 40 degrees centigrade, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. When the transformer is located in areas where noise is a factor, Specify sound levels at least 3 decibels below recommended values established by NEMA ST20. Derate the transformer in accordance with the manufacturer's guidance for locations with a maximum ambient temperature above 40 degrees centigrade, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, in accordance with NEMA ST20 for altitudes higher than 3300 feet, 1000 meters. Include the following as part of the installation. Mount the transformer so that vibrations are not transmitted to the surrounding structure. Small transformers can usually be solidly mounted on a reinforced concrete floor or wall. Flexible mounting will be necessary if the transformer is mounted to the structure in a normally low ambient noise area. Refer to TSEWG TP5 interior transformer ratings and installation for additional information regarding transformers and transformer ratings. Use flexible couplings and conduit to minimize vibration transmission through the connection points. Locate the transformer in spaces where the sound level is not increased by sound reflection. For example, in terms of sound emission, the least desirable transformer location is in a corner near the ceiling because the walls and ceiling function as a megaphone. Transformer spaces shall be adequately ventilated to prevent the temperature rise from exceeding the transformer rating. With regard to other transformers, do not use them unless justified and documented in the design analysis. With regard to service entrance and distribution equipment, locate the service entrance equipment and other major electrical equipment in a dedicated electrical equipment room. Provide a main breaker on each service entrance. Locate other electrical equipment such as electrical panels in dedicated spaces. Use a 100% rated main overcurrent device for sizes 400 amperes and larger. Size circuit breaker interrupting ratings based on the available short circuit current. However, do not select circuit breakers less than 10 kiliamps symmetrical interrupting rating for voltages 240 volts and below and 14 kiliamps symmetrical interrupting rating for 480 volt applications. Do not use series combination rated breakers or fusible overcurrent devices. With regard to switchgear and switchboards criteria, select low voltage switchboards versus switchgear as follows. Specify switchboards for service entrance equipment when the service is 1200 amps or larger 
in branch and feeder circuits are combined sizes from 20 amps up to 800 amps. Utilize switchboards throughout the distribution system where feeders are 1200 amps or larger. Devices must be front accessible and must be completely isolated between sections by vertical steel barriers. Switchboards shall have hinged fronts to allow safer maintenance access. Specify metal clad switchgear for service entrance equipment only when the service is 1200 amps or larger and all branch and feeder circuits are large, such as 600 amps or 800 amps. The circuit breakers must be electrically operated. The switchgear and circuit breakers must be the product of the same manufacturer. Consider remote racking device designs, robots, to rack breakers in and out. Select switchgear and switchboards of the dead front floor mounted freestanding metal enclosed type with copper bus and utilizing circuit breakers as circuit protective devices. Provide a minimum of 20% space only cubicles and appropriate bus provisions for future protective device additions to accommodate planned load growth. Ensure switchboards are designed in accordance with NEMA PB2 and UL891 listed. Place a safety sign on any cubicles containing more than one voltage source. Refer to ANSI Z535.4 for safety sign criteria. With regard to panel boards, specify panel boards for service entrance equipment when the service is less than 1200 amps and feeder circuits will fit in one panel board. Equip panel boards with separate ground bus bars and insulated neutral bus bars to isolate the bus bar when required by code from the panel board. Circuit breakers must be bolt-on type. Do not use dual section panel boards. Provide a minimum 20% empty space for all panel boards. For flush mounted panel boards, provide spare conduits extending up above the ceiling and down below raised floors when applicable. Provide one spare conduit, minimum of 3 quarter inch, for every three empty spaces. Use panel boards for service entrance equipment and electrical distribution in residential facilities. Load center style panel boards with plug-in breakers can be used in housing units and residential rooms. Ensure circuit breakers used as switches in 120 volt and 277 volt lighting circuits are listed for the purpose and are marked SWD or HID switching duty or high intensity discharge lighting. Provide arc fault circuit interrupter protection for branch circuits supplying 120 volt single phase 15 amp and 20 amp outlets installed in dwelling units as specifically required by NFPA 70. Distribution and branch circuit panel, panel boards should be of the wall mounted dead front type equipped with circuit breakers. Circuit breaker size should be a minimum one inch per pole with bolt-on breakers. Load center style panel boards with plug-in breakers should be used only where eight or fewer circuits are supplied and where light duty can be expected. Place panel boards as close as possible to the center of the loads to be served. Panel boards should have hinged fronts to allow safer maintenance access. Clearly fill out panel board circuit directories indicating the specific load and location, such as lights room 102. Optimize equipment layout and circuit arrangement. All home runs, identifying conduit and wiring back to panel, should be shown on the design drawings. Combine one pole branch circuits to minimize number of home runs. Do not show more than a three phase circuit or three-phase conductors, a neutral conductor, and an equipment grounding conductor in a single conduit. When more conductors are required, provide detailed calculations showing compliance with NFPA 70 for derating conductors and conduit fill. Refer to TSEWG TP6 low voltage breaker interrupting ratings 
for additional information regarding low voltage breaker interrupting ratings. Motor Control Centers shall comply with Underwriters Laboratories 845 and NEMA ICS2. With regard to power for fire protection systems, provide power from the service entrance equipment as follows. 208Y, 120 volt or 120, 240 volt systems. Provide lock-on breaker in the service equipment if more than one fire protection circuit is required, provide a dedicated emergency panel sized for a minimum of six circuits powered from the lock-on breaker in the service equipment. 480Y 277V systems provide circuit from the service entrance equipment as above to a dedicated emergency panel through a step-down transformer. Consider using a packaged power supply for this transformer emergency panel combination. Size the emergency panel for a minimum of six circuits. Locate the dedicated emergency panel near the service entrance equipment. In all cases, paint the lock-on breaker in the service entrance equipment and the dedicated emergency panel enclosure red. At the service entrance equipment, in addition to the panel nameplate, provide a label with the following inscription, Fire Protection Life Safety Equipment. Construct and fasten the label identical to the panel nameplate, except the label must be red laminated plastic with white center core. Fusible disconnect switches should be used only where special considerations require their use. Provide heavy-duty type safety switches on systems rated for greater than 240 volts. Use fused switches that utilize Class R fuse holders and fuses. Use NEMA 4X stainless steel switch enclosures for switches locating on building exteriors in areas where salt spray or extended high humidity is a concern. Utilize non-fused disconnect switches as local disconnects only, properly protected by an upstream protective device. Circuit lockout requirements, circuit breakers, disconnect switches, and other devices that are electrical energy isolating must be lockable in accordance with NFPA 70E and OSHA 1910.303. With regard to motors and motor control circuits, basic motor criteria. All motors shall have premium efficiency ratings per the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Use three-phase motors if more than one-half horsepower, 373 watts, rating when such service is available. If three-phase service is not available, operate motors 0.5 horsepower and larger at phase-to-phase -phase voltage rather than phase-to-neutral voltage. Motors smaller than one-half horsepower should be single phase with phase-to-phase -phase voltage preferred over phase-to-neutral voltage. Do not use 230 volt motors on 208 systems because the utilization voltage will commonly be below the minus 10% tolerance on the voltage rating for which the motor is designed. A 230 volt motor is intended for use on a nominal 240 volt system. Provide motor controllers, starters, for motors larger than 0.125 horsepower and apply the design criteria of NEMA ICS1 and NEMA ICS2. Use full voltage type starting unless the motor starting circuit will result in more than a 20% transient voltage dip or if the analyzed voltage dip is otherwise determined to be unacceptable. For other than full voltage starting, apply one of the following methods for motor starting. Reduced voltage starters. Adjustable speed drives are also referred to as variable frequency drives. 
If an adjustable speed drive is required for other reasons, it can also address motor starting current design needs. Refer to NEMA ICS-7 for design criteria related to the selection and design of adjustable speed drives. Provide information regarding the sizing and operational design of adjustable speed drives. Provide manual control capability for all installations having automatic control that operates the motor directly. Use a double throw, three position switch, or other suitable device marked manual off automatic for the manual control. Confirm that all safety control devices, such as low or high pressure cutouts, high temperature cutouts, and motor overload protective devices remain connected in the motor control circuit in both the manual and automatic positions. Provide surge protective devices for surge protection of sensitive or critical electronic equipment and when specifically required. Use type 1 or type 2 SPD and connect on the load side of a dedicated circuit breaker of the associated main distribution or branch panel board, switchboard, or switchgear. Locate as close as practical to the breaker with a maximum lead length of three feet. The term transient volt surge suppression, TVSS, is also used to describe SPDs. The design criteria provided here apply to permanently installed hardwired surge protectors and should not be applied to plug-in type surge protectors, type 3. Use point-of-use plug-in type surge protectors to protect specific critical equipment that plugs into wall receptacles. For buildings with high concentrations of electronic equipment, employ a two-stage or cascaded system. Coordinate multiple stage surge protection. Do not install SPD inside a panel board or switchboard enclosure. However, SPD can be installed in a separate compartment of a switchboard provided that it is supplied by a dedicated circuit breaker. With regard to service entrance surge protection devices, provide the following specification requirements for surge protection devices on the service entrance equipment. Use SPD to protect the electrical service entrance equipment. The SPD must meet or have a voltage protection rating that is less than the UL1449 voltage protection ratings listed below. If surge protection is required as part of a lightning protection system, comply with the more stringent voltage protection ratings specified in NFPA 780. This table indicates the system voltage protection modes and voltage protection rating requirements. Per mode single pulse surge current rating for an 8 by 10 MS waveform must be no less than LN 40 kiloamps, LG 40, NG 40, LL 80. Protection mode provide the following six modes. Additional modes are permitted. Line to line, line to ground, or line to neutral SPDs at grounded service entrances shall be wired in a line to ground or line to neutral configuration. For services without a neutral, SPD elements shall be connected line to ground. MCOV for LN and LG modes of operation, 125% of nominal voltage for 240 volts and below, 120% of nominal voltage above 200 volt, 240 volts to 480 volts. Surge life greater than 5,000 surges of repetitive sequential IEEE C62.41 category C3 waveforms 
with less than 10% degradation of measured limiting voltage. The total unit as installed must be UL1283 and UL1449 listed and not merely the components or modules. Not less than a five-year warranty and include unlimited free replacements of the unit if destroyed by lightning or other transients during the warranty period. Visual indication unit has malfunctioned or requires replacement. Provide Form C dry contacts for remote monitoring. With regard to branch panel board surge protection, provide the following specification requirements for surge protection devices on all the branch panel boards for facilities requiring cascaded suppression system protection. Use surge protection devices to protect the distribution branch panel boards. The SPD must meet or have a voltage protection rating that is less than the UL1449 voltage protection ratings listed below. This table provides the voltages, the protection modes, and the voltage protection ratings. LN is line to neutral, LG line to ground, NG neutral to ground, LL line to line. Per mode single pulse surge current rating for an 8 by 20 waveform shall be no less than as indicated. Protection mode provide the following six modes. Additional modes are permitted line to line, line to ground, or line to neutral surge protection devices at grounded service entrances shall be wired in a line to ground or line to neutral configuration for services without a neutral surge protection device elements shall be connected line to ground. MCOV for LN, LG, and NG modes of operation are 125% of nominal voltage for 240 volts and below, 120% of nominal voltage above 240 volts to 480 volts. Surge life greater than 5,000 surges of repetitive sequential IEEE C62.41 category B3 waveforms with less than 10% degradation of measured limiting voltage. The total unit as installed must be UL1283 and UL1449 listed and not merely the components or modules not less than a five-year warranty, including unlimited free replacements of the unit if destroyed by lightning or other transients during the warranty period, and visual indication unit has malfunctioned or requires replacement provides C dry contacts for remote monitoring. Dwelling units protection install as close as practical to the main breaker lugs. All leads must be as short as possible with no leads longer than 24 inches. Provide protection in accordance with branch panel board surge protection criteria listed above. With regard to surge protection for communications and related systems, provide surge protection for the following systems, including related systems. Fire alarm systems, telephone systems, computer data circuits, circuit uh, security systems, television systems, coaxial cable systems, intercom systems, electronic equipment data lines. Surge protection equipment used for communications and related systems shall be UL listed or third party verified and tested to UL 497A. If surge protection is required as part of a lightning protection system, comply with the more stringent voltage protection requirements specified in NFPA 780. Telephone communication interface circuit protection shall provide a minimum surge current rating of 9,000 amps. Central office telephone line protection shall have multi-stage protection with a minimum surge current rating of 4,000 amps. Intercom circuit protection shall have a minimum surge current rating of 9,000 amps. 
provide protection on points of entry and exit from separate buildings, provide fire alarm and security alarm system loops and addressable circuits that enter or leave separate buildings with a minimum of 9,000 amps surge current rating. Annunciation shall be UL listed or third party verified and tested to UL 497B. Protect coaxial lines at points of entry and exit from separate buildings. Single stage gas discharge protectors can be used for less critical circuits. Multi-stage protectors utilizing a gas discharge protector with solid state secondary stages shall be used to obtain lower let through voltages for more critical applications. With regard to acceptance tests, perform the following installation checks. Inspect for physical damage and compare nameplate data with drawings and specifications. Verify that the surge protector rating is appropriate for the voltage. Inspect for proper mounting and adequate clearances. Verify that the installation achieves the minimum possible lead lengths. Inspect the wiring for loops or sharp bends that add to the overall inductance. Check tightness of connections by using a calibrated torque wrench. Refer to the manufacturer's instructions or Table 10.1 of the International Electrical Testing Association, NITA ATS, for the recommended torque. Check the ground lead on each device for individual attachment to the ground bus or ground electrode. Perform insulation resistance tests in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. For surge protectors with visual indications of proper operation in indicating lights, verify that the surge protector displays normal operating characteristics and record the date of installation. Provide smart metering systems, that is, with remote reading, monitoring, or activation capabilities in accordance with owner's specific criteria to comply with requirements. Coordinate meters, system components, and meter locations to be compatible with the owner's central system. With regard to raceway and wiring, wiring devices and faceplate colors must match and be consistent with the interior wall types and colors. Use grounding type wiring devices. Outlet boxes must not be placed back to back. Provide a minimum of 12 inches of separation between outlet boxes located on opposite sides of common walls. Toggle switches must be specification grade, quiet type, and rated minimum 120, 277 volt, 20 amp totally enclosed with bodies of thermoplastic and or thermoset plastic and mounting strap with grounding screw. Use silver cadmium contacts and one piece copper alloy contact arm. When specified, pilot lights must be integrally constructed as a part of the switch's handle. Provide general purpose convenience outlets that are specification grade 20 amp 120 volt duplex. In addition to the location requirements specified by NFPA 70, locate general purpose and dedicated on an individual circuit outlets in accordance with the following. Mechanical equipment. Provide receptacles within 25 feet of mechanical equipment on the interior and exterior of buildings. Office, staff support spaces and other workstation locations. One receptacle for each workstation with a minimum of one for every 10 feet of wall space. When less than 10 feet of wall at the floor line, provide a minimum of two receptacles spaced appropriately to anticipate furniture relocations. Limit loads to a maximum of four workstations per 20 amp circuit. For conference rooms and training rooms, one for every 12 feet of wall space at the floor line. 
ensure one receptacle is located next to each voice data outlet, provide one receptacle above the ceiling to support video projection device, extend circuit to wall location for connection to motorized screen, when it is expected that a conference room table will be specifically dedicated to floor space in a conference room, locate a floor mounted receptacle under the table. This receptacle may be part of combination power communications outlet. Provide power outlets throughout the building to serve all proposed equipment including furnished equipment and allow for future reconfiguration of equipment layout. Provide power connections to all ancillary office equipment such as printers, faxes, plotters, and shredders. Provide dedicated circuits where warranted. In all telecommunications rooms, provide a dedicated 20 amp circuit with a receptacle adjacent to each rack or backbone for each of the following. CCTV for training systems, CCS TV for security systems, CATV voice systems, and data systems. Provide dedicated receptacles as required throughout the facility for television monitors. These outlets will typically be located at the ceiling level for wall-mounted television monitors. However, similar specialty equipment can share the same circuit. Corridors, one every 50 feet with a minimum of one per corridor. Janitor's closet and toilet rooms, one GFI receptacle per closet. Provide GFI receptacles at counter height for each counter in toilets, such that there is a minimum of one outlet for each two sinks. Space with countertops, one for every four feet of countertop with a minimum of one outlet. Provide GFI protection of outlets when located within six feet of plumbing fixtures. Building exterior, one for each wall, GFI protected and weatherproof. Kitchen, non-residential, one for each 10 feet of wall space at the floor line. Provide GFI protection when located within six feet of plumbing fixture. Dwelling units, child development centers, and other child-occupied spaces, including toilets, provide listed tamper-resistant receptacles. All other rooms, one for every 25 feet of wall space at the floor line. When 25 feet or less of wall at the floor line exists in a room, provide a minimum of two receptacles spaced appropriately to anticipate furniture relocations. Special purpose receptacles coordinate with the user to provide any special purpose outlets required. Provide outlets to allow connection of equipment in special use rooms. With regard to raceway criteria, install all wiring in raceways unless specifically indicated otherwise. Minimum permitted size conduit is one half inch. Provide an insulated green equipment grounding conductor for all circuits installed in raceways. Can steel seal raceways above ceilings and in finished areas that have finished walls or finished surfaces. Do not use electrical non-metallic tubing, ENT, or flexible non-metallic tubing and associated fittings. The following summarizes approved raceway types and their limitations of use. Galvanized rigid steel conduit, specify GRS conduit where exposed to weather, where subject to physical damage, and where exposed on exterior of buildings. Intermediate metal conduit, IMC, may be used in lieu of GRS as allowed by NFPA 70. Electrical metallic tubing, EMT, Specify EMT for branch circuits and feeders above suspended ceilings or exposed where not subject to physical damage. Do not use EMT underground, encased in concrete, mortar, or grout in hazardous locations where exposed to physical damage, outdoors, or in fire pump rooms. 
use die cast compression connectors. Flexible metal conduit. Flexible metal conduit can be used limited to six foot length for recessed and semi-recessed lighting fixtures, for equipment subject to vibration, and for motors other than pumps. Use liquid tight flexible metal conduit in damp and wet locations and for pumps. Polyvinyl chloride PVC specify schedule 40 PVC minimum for service entrance conduits from the service utility to the substation or underground below floor slabs. PVC is not approved for use when restrictions are stipulated in other industry standards or UFCs for specific types of buildings such as medical facilities. Surface metal raceways specify two-piece painted steel totally enclosed snap cover type multiple outlet type raceway only for shops, laboratories, and medical facilities. Convert non-metallic conduit other than PVC Schedule 40 or 80 to plastic coated rigid or IMC steel conduit before rising through floor slab. Use surface metal raceways or multi-outlet assemblies only for building improvements or renovations or for applications where a variety of cord and plug connected equipment will be utilized in a limited space, such as in some areas of medical facilities, shops, and laboratories. Refer to TSEW GTP8 electrical equipment enclosures and hazardous locations for additional information regarding equipment enclosures and hazardous locations. With regard to conductors, conductors number six, AWG and smaller must be copper. Aluminum conductors of equivalent ampacity can be used instead of copper for number four AWG and larger sizes. Branch circuit conductors, including power and lighting applications will in no case be less than number 12 AWG. Branch circuit breakers shall be 20 amps minimum, except where lesser ratings are required for specific la applications. Lighting design is not part of this discussion of uh, interior electrical distribution. With regard to emergency generators and the applications of them, Emergency generators and related wiring systems are authorized for use when needed to support critical functions in the following types of facilities and locations. Medical treatment facilities, air transportation navigation aids and facilities, refrigerated storage rooms, POL, petroleum oil lubricant storage and dispensing facilities, critical utility plants and systems, civil engineering control centers, communication facilities and telephone exchanges, fire stations including fire alarm, fire control and radio equipment, critical computer automatic data, airport traffic control towers, weather stations, surveillance and warning systems, central control facilities, security lighting systems, law enforcement and security facilities, emergency operations centers, critical activity property and life support facilities at remote and not readily accessible sites, industrial facilities that have noxious fumes requiring removal, provide power for exhaust system only. Load analysis Determine what loads or facilities need to continue to function following a loss of normal power. Evaluate which loads must be uninterruptible, can experience momentary power loss, or can experience a longer duration power loss. Apply the following documents to determine which loads require backup power and should be reviewed as part of a backup power needs analysis. IEEE Standard 446 provides a de detailed discussion of how to evaluate the need for backup power. NFPA 110 provides specific criteria for backup power systems. 
NFPA 111 establishes the NFPA requirements associated with backup power systems. Service entrance design. If the facility has a permanently installed emergency power source, provide a separate panel to supply only the loads requiring emergency power. This panel will normally be supplied by the upstream main distribution panel. Do not design the system in a manner that allows non-essential loads to be carried by the emergency power source. If the facility is intended to have the capability to connect portable emergency power generation, install a manually operated safety switch designed for this purpose on the exterior of the facility. Alternatively, an approved cable connection system can be installed with the cable connector located on the exterior of the facility and connected on the interior of the facility to a normally open safety switch or circuit breaker. With regard to automatic transfer equipment, provide an open transmission transition transfer scheme unless the system requires paralleling with the utility. Closed transition transfer is rarely required for backup power applications. Closed transition will require coordination with the local utility and will require designing for the higher available short circuit current of the combined parallel sources. Provide four pole ATS designs to ensure that the neutral is switched with the circuit. If allowed by the facility layout, locate the transfer switch near the load. This increases system reliability by minimizing the length of the run common to both power sources from the transfer switch to the load. Design feeder routing with physical separation between the normal power feeders and the emergency feeders. This minimizes the possibility that both power sources will be simultaneously interrupted by a localized problem within the facility. Where possible, use a greater number of small transfer switches rather than a lesser number of large transfer switches. By this approach, failure of a single transfer switch should not affect the entire facility. Include a fully rated brake and load maintenance bypass switch in parallel with the closed transition ATS. The ATS shall be designed for maintenance and repair without requiring shutdown of the associated system. Refer to NFPA 99 for any transfer switch applications involving medical facilities. The following references provide additional information regarding automatic transfer switches. EGSA 100S contains classifications, applications, and performance requirements for transfer switches for emergency and standby transfer switches. IEEE Standard 446 discusses uh, ATS applications. NFPA 99 provides specific electrical requirements for medical facilities and addresses transfer switch requirements in detail. NFPA 111 establishes the NFPA requirements for ATS designs. UL 1008 establishes ATS certification requirements and it is a useful reference source for ATS ratings. With regard to stationary batteries and battery chargers, their selection, use vented lead acid batteries preferentially for switchgear control power and UPS applications. Batteries for switchgear or backup power applications should be rated for general purpose switchgear or utility use. Batteries for UPS applications should be rated for UPS or high rate use. Nickel cadmium batteries are often more expensive than vented lead acid batteries and should be considered primarily for extreme temperature environments or engine starting applications. Nickel cadmium batteries are preferred for engine starting applications because of their high rate discharge capability and their more predictable failure modes. As a general practice, do not use valve-regulated lead-acid battery 
if a vented lead acid battery will satisfy the design and installation requirements. VRLA batteries have exhibited a shorter service life than vented equivalents and have shown a tendency to fail without warning. Refer to IEEE standard 1189 for additional information regarding the unique failure modes and shorter service life of this battery type. VRLA batteries are allowed to be used in the following types of applications. Installation with small footprints such that a vented battery with adequate power density will not fit within the available space. Locations in which the consequences of electrolyte leakage cannot be allowed. UPS systems are often located in areas that necessitate the use of a VRLA battery. Do not use VRLA batteries in the following types of applications. Unregulated environments that can experience abnormally high and low temperatures. Unmonitored locations that seldom receive periodic maintenance checks. VRLA batteries have shown a tendency to fail within only a few years after installation. Critical applications unless the installation location requires the features available only in a VRLA battery. Apply the following service life for life cycle cost comparisons of stationary batteries. Small VRLA batteries 3 years. Large VRLA batteries 7 years. Small vented lead acid batteries 10 years, large vented lead acid batteries 15 years, nickel cadmium batteries 15 years. Installation design. The industry standards review the following IEEE standards as applicable for the battery type prior to the installation. IEEE standard 450 provides maintenance and test criteria for vented lead acid batteries. IEEE standard 484 provides installation criteria for vented lead acid batteries. IEEE standard 485 defines battery sizing requirements for lead acid batteries. IEEE standard 1106 provides maintenance and test criteria for nickel cadmium batteries. IEEE standard 1115 defines battery sizing requirements for nickel cadmium batteries. IEEE standard 1184 provides application and sizing criteria for UPS applications. IEEE standard 1187 provides installation criteria for valve regulated lead acid batteries. IEEE standard 1188 provides maintenance and test criteria for valve regulated lead acid batteries and IEEE standard 1189 explains application limitations for valve regulated lead acid batteries. Size the battery in accordance with IEEE standard 485, 1115 or 1184 as appropriate for the selected battery type and application. Design and install the battery in accordance with IEEE standard 484, 1187, or 1106 as appropriate for the selected battery type. Refer to the above industry standards and NITA ATS for acceptance test criteria. For battery chargers, use single phase chargers for smaller applications. Rate single phase battery chargers for 240 volt single phase unless only 120 volt is available. Use three phase chargers if the charger's DC output current rating will be greater than 75 amps. Unless the battery has specific requirements to the contrary, all chargers shall be of the constant voltage type. Install a circuit breaker or fused protection device as close to the battery as possible. Provide overcurrent protection for each string in a parallel battery system. Refer to IEEE standard 1375 for additional guidance. For grounding, bonding, and static protection comply with NFPA 70. 
for ground rods, ground rod composition, minimum spacing requirements and connections shall conform to the requirements of NFPA 70 section 250, except that minimum length dimensions shall be 10 feet in length and 3 quarter inch diameter. Ground rods shall be copper clad steel, solid copper, or stainless steel. All connections to ground rods below ground level must be by exothermic weld connection or with a high compression connection using a hydraulic or electric compression tool to provide the correct circumferential pressure. Accessible connections above ground level and in test wells can be accomplished by clamping. Spacing for driving additional grounds must be a minimum of 10 feet. Bond these driven electrodes together with a minimum of four AWG soft drawn bare copper wire buried to a depth of at least 12 inches. Install ground rods and ground ring if applicable, three feet to eight feet beyond the perimeter of the building foundation and at least beyond the drip line for the facility. Provide a ground ring counterpoise for facilities with sensitive electronic equipment or other applications when identified by project requirements. A ground ring shall have at least two ground rods located diagonally at opposite corners. When required by a specific activity or facility, provide a ground rod at each change in direction of the ground ring and install test wells for at least two of the corner ground rods to allow for testing of the system. Assemble test wells with bolted connections to facilitate future testing. Provide grounding electrode systems for communications electronics facilities in accordance with owner requirements. For static electricity protection comply with owner requirements and for lightning protection systems provide systems in accordance with best practices and owner requirements. For 400 cycle 400 Hertz distribution systems uh, design in accordance with best practices and owner requirements. 270 volt DC distribution systems uh, are not part of this discussion. Power factor correction, the power factor within a facility is normally 0.9 lagging or greater. Therefore, power factor correction is not routinely required for interior electrical systems. With regard to power quality, design secondary electrical systems to mitigate the harmonic effects of nonlinear loads as a result of connections to electronic loads, including computer workstations, file servers, UPS, and electronic ballasts. With regard to systems furniture, when systems furniture is utilized, the electrical engineer, the architect, and the interior designer must coordinate during the design process. Systems furniture is typically specified and ordered when construction is nearing completion. Therefore, if proper coordination has not occurred earlier in the design process, field interface problems will occur. Systems furniture is pre-wired to a wiring harness. Unless specified otherwise, select a standard wiring harness that meets one of the following configurations. Five wire harness consisting of three circuit conductors, one oversized neutral conductor, and one equipment grounding conductor. 8-wire harness consisting of four circuit conductors, one oversized neutral conductor, one full-size neutral conductor, and two separate equipment grounding conductors. Serve 5-wire harnesses with three separate circuits and 8-wire harnesses with four separate circuits. Provide oversized neutrals to match the harness configuration. and balance loads between circuits and phases. A single circuit shall not serve more than four cubicles under any circumstances. The following slides provide abbreviations and acronyms in a glossary. And these may be helpful to you moving forward.
and some of the terms that have been used in this discussion are further defined in this section. And that brings us to the conclusion of this discussion of interior electrical distribution systems. I hope this has been somewhat helpful to you and uh, will allow you to move forward and address uh, interior electrical distribution systems in projects as they come across your desk in the future. And with that, thank you very much and have a nice rest of the day.